This video goes over the rules on how to name an ionic compound that contains a metal with more than one cation. So um, again, I want to start with the idea of how will we know when we see a formula if something is an ionic compound. Um, because that's very important when you're naming because the rules we go over can involve ionic compounds or covalent compounds or acids. So um, we just need to be familiar with what we're looking for. And ionic compounds are going to be compounds that contain a metal and nonmetals. Now, really what we're saying is that they're going to contain cations, which are formed by metals, and anions, which are formed by nonmetals. Now, remember, cations have a positive charge, and nonmetals have a negative charge. Now, in this particular rule, we're going over the situation when we have a metal that has more than one cation. So what it means is that there are some metals, and we'll take a look in a minute, I'll be more specific, that can form more than one positive charge. Now, generally, these elements or these metals are in the transition metals, so they're in the middle. And in the what we call post-transition metals, which means after. Let's take a look on my ion periodic table. So if you remember, the groups that are tall here, they're called the main group, these here and these here. And for the most part, we predict the charges using the octet rule. And so for most of these, um, elements, especially the metals, in the main group, that's everything with an A, the tall columns, they all form just a single cation. But if you look in the transition metals, which are now in this section here, and then the post-transition metals, which are right here, right after, you notice that on this periodic table that's representing the ions, there are several of them that have two possibilities inside of them. And so these are the metals that can form more than one cation. Now I notice that there are also some down here in the inner transition elements, which we really don't usually see compounds with those elements, but just for awareness, you can see that there are some. Now just because you're a transition metal doesn't mean you can form more than one cation. You can see here it's what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 of them. So in the big picture, if you have to take more chemistry, what you end up doing is memorizing these uh, more common uh, transition metals and post-transition metals that form more than one cation. I have in the study guide a list of a few of them that I recommend that you memorize just to simply make your uh, things easier. So how are we going to go about naming these? And I accidentally put the example before the rule, so it's okay. So here's the rule. You're going to name the cation 
followed by the name of the anion. Now this might sound familiar because, um, I'm sorry, I had to concentrate. So uh, on all of the ionic compounds, this is the general idea. You name the cation followed by the name of the anion. Now here, the complication comes in because this name of the cation is going to be slightly different than we're used to. So normally when we name the cation, we name it the same as the element name. And that's still true. The difference in this example is because they have more than one cation or they can have more than one charge, we have to indicate that in the name. So as a part of the name, we're going to write the charge as a Roman numeral. This is called the stock system, and it's more modern. There's also a classical system, um, and if you've had chemistry before or this is that you'd like to learn the classical system, you're welcome to. It uses Latin names and suffixes like ik and us, um, so you're welcome to learn that, but in class, I'm going to use the stock system. So let me give you an example of what this would mean. So iron with a two plus would not just be iron, it would be an iron with a Roman numeral two. So that Roman numeral two does not indicate anything about how many iron. The two tells us the charge. So iron also has a three plus. And so then the charge would be a three. So it would be iron, Roman numeral, three. Another example, lead, can have a two plus. So this would be called lead with a Roman numeral two. Or it can be lead with a four plus. So this would be lead with a Roman numeral four. So the change here, when we have more than one cation that can form, is the name will now include a Roman numeral. And the Roman numeral tells us which charge it is. Now, why this is important is because it's the charge that will dictate the formula. So we need to know the charge. So an iron with a 2 plus is going to have a different formula than, uh, than an iron with a 3 plus. Now then, what happens, I find, in, is once you realize there's Roman numerals, you now want to put Roman numerals behind all of the metal's names. For example, calcium has a two plus. It's a alkaline earth metal. Uh, octet rule predicts it's a two plus. It can only form a two plus. So because it can only form a two plus, we just name it as a calcium ion, not calcium Roman numeral two. Okay, and the reason is, is because calcium only has one cation.
Now, so this is another reason to become familiar with the elements that can form more than one, so you know when to use uh, Roman numerals. I encourage you to use that reference ion periodic table as you're learning. I also encourage you, when you see a formula that has a transition metal or a post-transition metal right after the transition metals, I encourage you, until you are more familiar, to look back at that reference chart, so you're making sure you're not forgetting a Roman numeral. Now, the anion is going to be named like we named him before. So, uh, the name of the anion, and I didn't leave myself quite enough room, but it's going to be the stem of the element and change the ending to IDE. So, let's do some examples and try to apply this rule. So here's several examples, and all of these I have chosen are um, elements that have more than one charge. Like I can look at iron, oh, I didn't mean to erase that whole thing, sorry. Let me bring it back to us, there we go. I just meant to erase the writing, but it's all good. So iron is right here, it's a two plus and a three plus. So it could be either one. So how would we know which one it was going to be? Well, remember the crossover. Uh, that's where, let me do an example down here just at the bottom. So that's where we would say like um, magnesium is a two plus and bromine is a one minus. So to figure out the formula, for magnesium, we look up here, and since bromide is a one negative, we just use one. And to figure out bromide, we uh, look back here, and since magnesium's a two, we need two of them. So what I want you to see, if, you, if you're understanding that, is that this number right here helps us figure out the charge. So for iron, I know it's going to be an iron one or, I mean, sorry, an iron two or an iron three. But I don't know which one it is just until I look at the formula. So do you see it takes two chloride ions to balance it? So this is an iron two. That's the name of this. And then Cl is chloride. So remember, the 2 is not telling me the um, how many ions I have. It's telling me the charge of the ion. So following that reasoning, this iron, if it takes 3 chlorides to balance it, then this is going to be an iron 3. So it's iron 3 chloride. Now, if you have two elements and they're one to one, what we know is that the number on their charge is the same. That's how we get a one to one ratio, a one plus and a one plus, or a two plus and a two, I'm sorry, a one plus and a one minus, or a two plus and a two minus, or a three plus and a three minus. Those all give us a one to one ratio. So if I look here, I know that sulfur, which is in group 6A, 6A from the octet rule is a 2 negative. So this sulfur is a 2 negative. That means if I have one copper and one sulfur, the copper must be a 2 positive. So I have copper... Roman numeral two, sulfide. So how I am figuring out the charge on these metals that have more than one cation is by looking at the anion that it's with. If you're struggling with that idea, my recommendation is you uh, work more on putting formulas together 
charges together. We did this in a previous chapter. And once you build your confidence there, um, this will make a little bit more sense. Now, so for this one, I know PB is lead. And if I look back here, lead is right there. Do you see it can be a two or a four? So how do I know what it is? I look to see what it's with. And it takes four bromide ions to balance this. So that means the lead must have a four charge. So this is lead with a Roman numeral four and then bromide. We're naming the two elements. So see lead with a four plus, its name is lead four. So I'm really just naming the lead. Ionic compounds, you're just naming the two things that are present. Now I included in this last example a polyatomic ion. And I have a video on naming polyatomic ions as well. But polyatomic ions, and here's some common ones, are just like what they say, these are many atom ions. So they have more than one atom, um, and then they have a charge. And the hard thing about polyatomic ions is they have their own names and their own formulas. So um, you have to memorize those or look at a table like this one. Again, in the study guide, I have a list of ones that I recommend you memorize. There are some ways to have little shortcuts once you've memorized a few of them, but you've got to start somewhere memorizing them. So when I look at what I have on this last example, on this page, I have nickel, and then I have SO4. So if I look, my nickel can be a two plus or a three plus. Let's remember that when I go back. And then SO4, if you're looking, here it is, SO4, its name is sulfate. So this name right there is sulfate. And I mentioned that nickel could be a two plus or nickel could be a three plus. Now how we figure out what nickel is is by looking at what it's with. And do you see that it takes three sulfate ions to balance the nickel? That means this must be a nickel with a three because it takes three of the anions to cancel it. So this is nickel with a Roman numeral three and then it's with sulfate. Now you might be thinking, but what about that two? Why isn't it a nickel Roman numeral two? Remember the Roman numeral doesn't tell you how many you have, it tells you the charge. And so the charge is related to what it takes to cancel it out, so it's that number. If I had a nickel with a two plus, and I tried to put it with a sulfate that also has a two plus, do you see if it's a two plus and a two minus, it's one of each. So that would be NiSO4. And this is what nickel with a Roman numeral two sulfate looks like. Because remember, the Roman numeral is telling you the charge. So before we finish this video, I'd like to do some where I'm given the name and I have to go through the charges to figure out the formula. Naming takes a lot of practice, and so I really encourage you to practice it. It's not really fun, um, but it will help you build confidence and be something in the future you'll be glad that you have a better understanding of, at least the future of this class. So in this case, these are names here. And in order to create a formula from a name, I'm going to have to turn the names first into their ions. 
So copper with a Roman numeral two is copper with a two plus. That's what this is right here. And chloride is a halogen. So chloride is right here. And halogens, we predict from the um, octet rule, they all have a negative one. And so from the ions, I'm going to write the formula. To write the formula from the ions, I will look at the charges. So copper, since chloride has a one, then it's gonna take one copper. And the chloride, since copper has a two, it's gonna take two chlorides. So remember, a shortcut when the charges are different is to simply look at the number on the opposite charge. And that will quickly tell you what you need to cancel those two ions. Now, I'm not moving charges around. They're not swapping. This is just a quick way to figure out how to get the charges to cancel. So let's try the next one. So nickel with a three plus behind it. So that's nickel three plus oxide. So oxygen is right here. It's also in group 6A, and the um, octet rule says this is a 2 negative. So for nickel, I look over here, and it's a 2, so it's going to take 2 nickels. For oxide, I look over here, and it's a three, so it's gonna take three oxides. So remember, to get from a name to a formula, you have to use the charges. So you have to get the ions to get to the formula. So this is 10, two, so 10 is S, N, and then a two plus. 10 is not one I had you memorize, so you might have to look on the periodic table. Now, this says sulfate. Polyatomic ions typically end with A-T-E or I-T-E. So when I see A-T-E, I know this is a polyatomic ion. So it's sulfate, which is SO4 with a 2 negative. Now, when you are writing formulas and you have polyatomic ions, all of this right here does not make a difference. Like what we need to do, it's not gonna change the formula. What we need to look at, again, are the charges. So in this case, I have a two plus and a two minus. I'm gonna rewrite my SO4. So since they both have the same charge, it takes one of each. So that would be one, one, 10, and one sulfate. Now notice I'm just writing the SO4. That's the formula for sulfate. There's no parentheses when you only need one. You just write it. Now, if you don't know polyatomic ions, it looks really kind of weird. But once you memorize that sulfate is SO4, then it looks more familiar. So that can be a goal for everybody. Now, here is copper 1. So that would be copper with a 1 positive. And then with nitrate. Oh, nitrite, sorry. So that is in a... Uh, I-T-E, which tells me it's a polyatomic ion. So, nitrite. It's right here. N-O-2 with a negative. Negative. 
Now again, this part really doesn't matter. What I need to be looking at, whoops, I didn't mean to erase that one, sorry. Oh, I'm still erasing, there we go. What I'm really looking at are the charges. So a plus one and a minus one, I need one of each. So this would be CuNO3. Now, I want to do one more because I didn't do any. I want to do a polyatomic ion where it has more than one. And I have a whole lesson on polyatomic ions, but I might have started whetting your appetite for polyatomic ions. Or you're like, I need more of them. So let me do one more. So let me choose iron 2 phosphate. Now, I would know this is a polyatomic ion because it ends in A-T-E. So iron 2, iron would be a 2 plus. And then phosphate, we can look back. Phosphate is right here. It's PO4, 3 negative. Sorry. So remember, this part is not going to change the formula. What we're trying to look at are the charges. All right. So Fe, how many am I going to need? Three. And then PO4, how many am I going to need? I look back here, two. So when you have a polyatomic ion, it's a group. So if you need more than one, you use parentheses. And what it's telling someone is, I need two of those polyatomic ions. So again, this, we're talking here about when metals have more than one cation. Don't forget the Roman numeral and practice. So uh, like usual, if you have any questions or need an, more clarification, or you just have an example in mind that you would like me to go over, please feel free to email me or to bring it to class and we'll go over it.